Hey everyone, this is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from New York, the world headquarters of Photo Shelter. You are watching I Love Photography Live. Maybe you're watching us with visuals on youtube.com slash photoshelter or you might be listening to the podcast by searching for I Love Photography on iTunes. Whatever the case is, we hope you have a great time watching us. And as usual, I'm joined by my co-host Sarah Jacobs. What's going on, Sarah? Hey, Alan. How you doing? It's a big uh, weekend for us. We have this thing called Photoville going on. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Photoville is at the Brooklyn, what, how, Brooklyn Bridge Park. And yes. It's a whole bunch of shipping containers converted into exhibit space. And it goes through September 28th. There's a whole uh, wall of photos called uh, The Fence at Photoville, um, for which I was a, a judge for. And Photo Shelter is sponsoring a whole bunch of Luminance talks um, on a variety of subjects. You still can register for some of them uh, today and tomorrow, but a lot of them are actually already sold out, which is fantastic. I know. We got a lot of registrants. I'm excited to see everybody. I'm headed out there right after the show today. Yeah. It's, it's really, you know, if you're in the New York area and you have a chance to stop by uh, between now and the end of the month, you definitely should go out. There's some fantastic photography the vibe is totally chill. It's just a really, really great uh, event put on by the, the good folk at uh, United Photo Industries. And it's all free. And it's all free. That's the biggest thing, yeah. Um, Photoville, check it out. So, Sarah, we have a lot to talk about as usual. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the first thing is actually something that came across my uh, Facebook Newsbook feed. Uh, Jim Estrin, as you know, uh, is the, the man behind the Lens blog in the New York Times. And he had put up a post with kind of an ambiguous comment about how this photographer had returned the money of a prize. And a couple people were chiming in, oh yeah, good for her. And I didn't, I didn't understand, obviously, the context until I actually read the article. Well, it turns out that the Iranian photographer Nusha Tavakolian won a 50,000 euro prize to photograph Iran and uh, did, you know, her, her vision uh, of her photography of Iran is not sensationalist at all. It's very, very quiet photography. It's very beautiful photography. Um, not overly beautiful, but it's, you know, they're, 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 they're quiet, thoughtful photos. It's not like photojournalism, like violent clashes, uh, etc. And, and she's not, also... Yeah, yeah, she's not perpet perpetuating stereotypes either. Exactly, which we always talk about, right? It's, it's the insider's view of Iran, not the Westerner's view of Iran. Well, it turns out that the billionaire who awarded the prize to her um, didn't like her edit and started interfering with uh, the, the edit and suggesting changes and whatnot. And Nusha, after I think it was three months, finally said, you know what, I've had it. This has been a horrible experience. Here's your money back. I don't need your money. And when I read the article, you can't just help but feel like, yes, that is awesome. <laughs> because, you know, if you're the money bags behind a contest, you should not have editorial control. And, and, the, and the jury sort of echoed that sentiment. It's like, why is this guy trying to interfere with the artistic vision? Like, you picked the winner, Nusha, because of her vision, and now you're trying to alter her vision. Right. He's not the artist. He's got to stay out of that. <laughs> He's the billionaire. Get out of there. Let's exactly. exactly. Um, yeah, I can't I mean I can't imagine someone trying to, you know, come in and distort your vision and control your voice of your project and I mean she says it at the very end of this article. She's just like this is my life, you know. This is not this is not a joke or a game like it is for him. And I I think that speaks so strongly. I mean, it's crazy. That, that quote was very, very powerful. Yes. Because, again, for a billionaire, 50,000 euros is nothing. And to sort of interfere and be like, oh, you're nobody, I'm making you. For her to stand up, and I don't care where you're from, 50,000 euros is a lot of money, wherever yeah. you're from. Uh, you know, some of the commenters suggested, hey, man, we could create a Kickstarter for her and get 50,000 euros in, like, a heartbeat. And I'm sure that is absolutely true, and, sh and somebody should do that. Uh, so, Nusha... Props to you, man. That's it's awesome. Stick it to the man. <laughs> Stick it to the man. Um, speaking of photojournalists, 
Ashley Gilbertson is a pretty well-known name uh, in photojournalism circles. He's a war photographer, conflict photographer. And Time Magazine hired him to take, quote, photos, a.k.a. screen grabs, of a video game called Last of Us, which is sort of this apocalyptic uh, video game. And uh, they wanted him to sort of insert himself into the scene as he would if he was there in real life as a photojournalist and take some photos. The, the essay is sort of interesting in that he, he kind of goes into the video game and he gets a lot of stress playing the video game and then he has trouble like focusing on taking the, the photos because he's so busy with the game and then he gets killed and then he has to restart and all this kind of stuff. So he goes back to the time offices and he asks one of the guys who plays video games to play the video game for him and then he can concentrate on taking photos, which was kind of interesting. What were your thoughts on the photos? Oh, man, these are creepy. And I feel like he, I mean, Ashley definitely talks about that, where, you know, he says it's none of the game's characters show any distress during the game, which made it really hard for him and just felt totally bizarre to be to be taking these photos or these screen grabs, basically. Um, and he says, you know, in the end, the, the, the characters' emotions basically mimicked the zombies that they were killing, you know? Um, so I think it left for some really creepy, creepy screen grabs. <laughs> the, the resolution and the rendering of video games nowadays is insane. You know, it almost, if, if from far away, like, like we're looking on the screen right now, you might think that it's real because the, the contrast and the shading and, and, and everything. I couldn't help but feel that this was a bit gimmicky. And the the reason why is because it's not it's not real life. It's like right. it's a very staged uh, it's a it's a staged narrative. Even though you know you're inside the video game and things are happening in real time, it's still a staged narrative. It's not real life, and it's sort of derivative of the projects that we've seen of screen grabs, like the Google Maps uh, project and some other things. Mm -hmm. But even um, those, I feel like those feel more well because they are real. <laughs> so yeah. those feel more real than this, absolutely. And and so much of, I mean, this is totally void of any emotion, which makes it very gimmicky, I think. Yeah, yeah. So with all due respect to Ashley, who is a great photographer, I didn't think this was a great project. I mean, great that Time hired him to do it. I'm all for hiring photographers. Um, and it's an interesting exercise, but I don't know that there's any, like, I don't, I hope it doesn't win any prizes. No, no. I hope he doesn't enter it into, like, WPVI or... <laughs> or, you know, something like that. Um, but I thought I would crush Ashley for a second and then bring up some other photos of him, real photos that we found over on the, the Quartz website. And this is a series that he shot. Um, and the title of this article is, The Most Arresting Images of War Are These Pictures of Dead Soldiers' Bedrooms. And I will say, it, it doesn't even have to be a soldier, and it doesn't even have to be a bedroom. There's something very emotional and sometimes almost ominous about entering a space that has been preserved that was was filled with a person before. So you, you look at, at Apple, they still have Steve Jobs' office preserved after three years. Untouched, preserved. And the same sensation you get going through these uh, bedrooms, the, the difference is that some of these soldiers who died were literally like kids you know, 18, 19, 20, etc., and you see relics of their life that, that remind you of that. So, for example, if we go down here, you know, like the soccer ball chair hmm. or all the hats and the posters and, the, you know, all of these reminders of these people were kids and the, the things that kids aspire to be when they're growing up, and it's sort of a very stark reminder of a life unfulfilled. Of course, the black and white gives it a nostalgic view. Um, he's cropped them in such a way that they're almost like panoramics. Uh, here's one. Um, Karina S. Lau, 20 years old, died when her helicopter was shot down by insurgents on November 2nd, 2003. So the, the teddy bear and the rabbit uh, on the bed. I mean, 20 years old, Sarah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, these are totally opposite of the video game, <laughs> obviously. And these are filled with, with kind of a heavy, 
heavy emotion. And yet, lack of subject. Lack of subject, but still the subject is very present because you're seeing all the things that surrounded the subject when they were alive. Right. And then again, going back to how old they were, it's not like, you know, your grandma who passed away when she was 85 or 100. It's, you know, 20 years old, 24 years old, 19 years old, etc. So, Ashley, great job on these images. Stick with that real photography, man. We dig it. We dig it. I don't know what took the Washington Post so long. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> they finally came up with their own photography blog, and the Washington Post has fantastic photography, really, really great photojournalists over there, and Marianne Galone is the um, director of photography there. But they just launched their photography blog called Insight. And uh, not a ton of stories up yet, but some nice photography. Yeah, in fact, the first one from today is Stuart Paley, who you and I interviewed on a couple episodes ago on yeah. I Love Photo. Yep. What a cool photo this one is. I know. Stuart, man. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about the layout of this because so much about photography is uh, connected with the presentation. And we've talked about in the past about how some of these very small local newspapers who are using off-the-shelf or, or inexpensive uh, content publishing systems make the photos really, really small. And I looked at this photo of Stewart's which is full screen, and it looks fantastic. And then once you get past that first story, they go into a two-column layout where the right column, as almost every layout has, has you know, most read, etc. But the photos become incredibly small all of a sudden. And it just doesn't do it justice at that size. Well, go into a post, though. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm, yeah once you're in the post, it's great. Right. Oh, you mean scanning through. Got that it. Stream, yeah. That stream is unfortunately plagued by that two column design with the right with the right. sidebar design. Right. Which just, you know, doesn't help it. But yeah, I mean this th this is what I'm talking about. This is how photos need to be presented on the web. Always. Always. Yeah. Big, not watermarked, good captioning. Um, and they look glorious. And, and like the Lens blog in the New York Times, they went with a really neutral, deep gray, so the photos really pop off the page. And it's important, I think, for the way that the photos are sort of psychologically perceived to have this, this presentation. So, you know, fix that stream. Eh, and nobody goes to the homepage anyway. That's what they all say, right? I right. Yeah, no one goes. <laughs> I love that stuff. We've talked about Danny Clinch before um, because he's shot a lot of campaigns for John Barbados, who's a men's uh, menswear designer. Um, but he has a new book coming out with a lot of his favorite musicians. And by the way, I pre-ordered it on Amazon after I saw this oh. article on Esquire. Awesome. Oh, man, Danny Clinch. He's just the ultimate cool guy. <laughs> he really is. You know, when you look at his photos, we, we saw a photo of Bruce Springsteen up there in black and white. When you look at some of these photos, and there's, there's 10 of them in this Esquire gallery, there's just a vibe to them. You know, I don't know, and I, I'd be hard-pressed to sort of describe exactly what it is. I mean, compositionally, clearly the guy's awesome. In this one, you know, both people have their mouth open, but for different <laughs> reasons. Um, they're just really, like, I wish I could take one photo like this a year. I know. Yeah, you can tell there's just such ease, um, especially just because how much work he's he has produced. But ease in making a good photograph, it does not feel forced. feels very natural. Even though he is creating these scenes, like the one with Elvis Costello and Questlove up there, yep. he talks about buying... Uh, buying a record player for them to sit around. So, you know, he created this scenario, and yet he knew exactly what they would want to talk about, what Elvis Costello and Questlove would want to talk about. They would want to talk about a record player. So we put one in front of them and created a very natural feeling scene and got a great shot. I, you know, it's, it's very interesting what he says at the top. Uh, there's a quote from Bruce Springsteen basically saying, when Danny shows up, it's like a reunion with someone you've spent a thousand nights talking music, dreaming your glory dreams, except that he's brought his camera too. <laughs> and when you talk about photographers having to be able to relate to their subjects in an easy way, I mean, I think that sums it up. Like, if you can 
if you can make a rock star feel that comfortable, you're going to get a good shot. Yeah. You know, there's just an intimacy also, I think, with the subject that really comes out. And I think to other great portraitists, you know, even contemporary guys like Peter Yang, like the guy is such a nice dude. You're just like, okay, there's nothing alarming about Peter Yang. I'm just going to have fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. His his work definitely comes to mind in making his subjects feel at ease and just have some fun. I would I would love to sit in on a Danny Clinch, you know, be fly on the wall on on a photo session with with some of these guys. That would be very very exciting. But I'm looking forward to getting the book. I think it comes yeah. out next month or something like that. Who knows? Who knows? The uh, Business Insider reports about the photographer Espen Hoggensen. Uh, and I believe he shot a photo of the Milky Way next to a mountain in Norway. Um, and that photo was purchased by Apple to be the background for the iPhone 6. <laughs> so here you go. Uh, Espen's original photo on the left that had a little cabin on it. And then Apple photoshopped that out and uh, put it as a background on the iPhone 6, which launched today. Um, wow. This uh, this story reminds me of the Charles or O'Rear image that was used for the Windows XP desktop, yes. which we had talked about, and I, I like the difference in delivery. So O'Rear, I mean, that was back in what, like 2000. He had the negative hand delivered up to <laughs> Windows uh, headquarters, whereas this guy for the iPhone, you know, six, he just uploads this image to his 500 pics, and Apple found it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty uh, great. Yeah, times they are changing. You know, I was thinking about that that Windows photo because, you know, he's he claimed, and I think accurately so, that it was probably the most seen photo ever in the history of man because of the number of installs of Windows XP or whatever it was. Right. Well, given the the rise of phones and how many phones are sold, I, I think that could be challenged in the future. Oh yeah, you think so? You think this one might be seen more than the XP? You know the 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 number of projections. You know they sold four million phones on the first day. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it might it might be. So I'm sort of inclined to think that it's possible. If if they sell you know a hundred million phones, ah, Windows has had more installs than that. But 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 still, it, it, it's interesting to think about which photos will be like the top ten ever seen photos in the world, and they're not. They're probably not the ones you ever think about. They're like these. I mean, they're beautiful photos, but they're they're mundane because they're backgrounds. Right, and they also weren't paid for as much as some of the more expensive photos ever sold. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't world. disclose how much he was paid. But he says that the the photo was originally licensed for uh, non-broadcast use, and then the company upgraded its license to include broadcast use in July. Um, so he says he's very excited, and he hopes it leads to the sale of more images. But he did not get rich. Whatever that means. <laughs> Whatever that means. That's true. We don't know what that means to him. What does rich mean to you, Espen? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Norway has a has because of the the gas uh, reserve sales. They're very they're a wealthy country. They take care of their people. Uh, he's got a, he's got Noma, the number one restaurant in the world, in Oslo. <laughs> like, what else does he need? <laughs> okay, yeah. There's all that too. <laughs> great yeah. photo. Great photo. My friend Amir sent me this one off of Mashable. Turns out Australia's best professional photographer is a wedding photographer. A guy by the name of James Simmons won the Canon AIPP Australian Professional Photographer of the Year. Now typically when you think of wedding photography, you think, okay, there's some good ones in there. You don't think like, oh, well, this guy's going to be the best photographer in <laughs> the country. Right. But these photos are pretty... Pretty awesome. Yeah, they're they're pretty spectacular. I mean, he's good. It's I think it's well deserved. But I I, I don't know who else has won this award in the past. To be honest, this so. is true. It's hard to say. But you know, we're looking at this photo. Uh, and by the way, I should mention you can you can get the links to all of these on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. We're looking at a photo outside of a church right after a wedding service, and I, I I'm sure this has been done before. I just haven't seen it. He's got the reflection of the church and some of the people in the rooftop of the limo. 
and it just makes for a beautiful composition. And we can't see the whole thing on my screen because it's too small, but I promise you it's a, it's a beautiful photo. Here are some guys on the rocks. I, compositionally, the guy is just, like, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, there's some great shots. The one um, of the party happening at the, at the bar, he uses some kind of off-camera flash. Yeah, and he does that a lot. Yeah, it, but it almost looks like it's composited with all, all the people interacting, and they just they all look so perfect. But he, he nails it he uh, really... a lot. <laughs> this yeah. one right here at the party. It almost looks composited. That that might be staged too, because it's just the the uh, the wedding party. Yeah, but, but it's whatever so the fun. case is, it, yeah, it's fun and it's lit so well. And yeah, you're right. I think it might be a composite because that would be that's a lot of a lot of lights to put in. To yes, you're scene. right. Totally, totally a lot of lights. <laughs> James Simmons, keep doing what you're doing. We like that. Yeah, I wonder if he makes trips to America for weddings. Yeah, I know. I mean, if you ever get married, you want to fly him over there. Uh, yeah. Flickr announced their 20 under 20, the inaugural celebration of the 20 most talented young photographers on Flickr with some familiar names. Yeah, including Olivia B., who we've Olivia talked B., about. Olivia B., yeah. I thought this was very appropriate for Flickr. I don't know how long they've been doing this, 20 under 20. It's the but... inaugural year. It's the first year they've been doing Oh, the first year. Okay, yeah. yeah. I was like, I don't think I've heard of this. But um, yeah. it's super, uh, it just makes sense for Flickr to do this. I'm glad they did. Because I know, I mean, PDN used to be the 30 under 30, but they kind of took out the under 30 part. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> I, maybe we should do the 10 under 10. 10 under 10, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. You know, uh, looking through these winners from Flickr, these kids, man, they know how to Photoshop. <laughs> they know how to Photoshop. Yes. They are using Photoshop like, like crazy. And actually, I find it interesting how much of the work is pretty similar. It's like all these kids are kind of... Sorry, I don't mean to refer to them as kids because some of them are like 20 years old. But, <laughs> um, you know, they're all seeing kind of this like fantastical, like, um, just magical worlds, and they're creating them through Photoshop and through manipulation. That, that was my main criticism of the work. First of all, I would love to be any of these people because I, I think that it's amazing that they're 20 or under and they're taking this level of photography. And it's a level of photography that couldn't have been attained for the most part in the analog age, in the film age, just because it's prohibitive. Like, you, you don't have Photoshop and you don't have, like, the film costs are so expensive, you would never be able to experiment as much right. as you can today. So that's a wonderful um, consequence of technology. But I do think that this Olivia B. style, uh, th this is such a stereotype, but there's a hipster quality to all of the images mm. that... that that I wish there was a little more uh, variety visually in what you see because what's to prevent one of these people from being a great portraitist or being a great sports photographer or mm. a great street photographer instead of these are me and my friends on a barren hillside uh, with a desaturated photo and they're hugging each other in their underwear. It's like that's like everybody <laughs> has that shot. <laughs> yeah, I would say though that I mean it's you know they're young and their access is limited. I mean, unless they're shooting, like, their high school's football game. No, it's true. It's true. But, but I, you know, it's funny because when you talk about access, I think a lot of older photographers would say, but teenagers have the best access because I can't go shoot a teen's party because that's, that's illegal. I need consent of right. parents. <laughs> right. And, and this is such a seminal part of life growing up and all, like, all the discovery and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. yeah I, mm. see, I see where you're coming from. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So I wasn't blown away by like all of them. Yeah. But I liked I liked a few. But yeah, they they all are trying to like emulate film. You're right. Yeah. It has a little bit like the hipster quality, <laughs> like whatever. <laughs> and well, you know, and and part of it is maybe the judges were were kind of assigning an aesthetic to that generation. Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe that every single person under 20 who was uploading images to Flickr had their photos look like this. But the judges said, okay, these 20 are representative of this millennial generation. So maybe it's the fault of the judges. Yeah, that's true. And I would say that Olivia B., she's the most, obviously, the most famous out of any of these photographers yes. that won. And she's kind of leading the pack, I'd say, with that. Stuff. Yeah, it's kind of her, so, her eye. Yeah. 
Yep. Okay, well, we still we still like the idea. Um, and <laughs> if, if Flickr wants us to be judges next year to have some more visual diversity, we're, we're welcome to, to that. Yeah, I would totally send us an email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or just tweet at us at hashtag I love photo. Sarah and I judge as a team. No, we oh, don't. that'd be great. That would be great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought this was funny. Over on Design Taxi, uh, a photographer named Max Schwartz um, decided that he's going to take Tinder headshots that help his subjects, quote, get laid. We talked about Tinder. Was that last week? We talked we about Tinder? Yeah, yeah. So Tinderella. Yeah. yeah, Tinderella, yeah. So Tinder is a, a dating app where you swipe right if you like someone and you swipe left if you don't. And if two people swipe right against each other, then all of a sudden you can message each other. So it's like the lowest, the lowest commitment dating app. It's not like you don't have to write a profile. You don't have to write an intro email. It's just like if you swiped, then there's interest. You just have to look good, which is why this photographer is doing this. That's his premise, right. So $75, you go over to Brooklyn, he takes a photo of you. He takes nice photos. He's got a huge light source, so all the lights diffuse. He seems to know how to get uh, a good photo of people out of it. Of course, all the subjects are like good-looking people in the first place. Right. Uh, he, he does some sort of post-processing, so there's this kind of warm, warm but still sort of grittiness to the images. And he says, anecdotally, yeah, people are getting more, more likes or swipes or whatever you want to call it. Um, the thing that, that, that struck me is like, this is a guy, and whether you agree that $75 is the appropriate amount or not, I'm sure there's a lot of photographers who say, that's, that's too little. The dude is working out of his, you know, his home in Brooklyn, and this is his constituency. So he's identified an audience, and I, th I think about... Uh, you know, this guy, Max Schwartz, versus a guy like Peter Hurley who's doing headshots for like $1,000 a sitting versus other guys who do corporate headshots and how they've all identified a different niche. Not to get all business on you, but, but we are talking about the photography of business sometimes. No, and it's, it's true. It's, it's good to note, too, that Tinder is free. It's a free app. So his yeah, prices and, can't be that high. <laughs> yeah, and like you're 23 years old and you're going to spend right. $1,000 on Tinder? No, you know, yeah. that, come on. <laughs> Um, so it was it was a fun little short, uh, and and the photos came out well. So you know what it it makes a difference to have a nice photo. That's a fact. And he does some of these before and afters, and I got to say, they look much better in the afters. It's worth seventy five bucks. I mean, yeah, I would use that photo for like my LinkedIn profile or something. <laughs> yeah, really, you should just go over there. It's probably the cheapest photo. I mean, you know, a lot of photographers in the office would do it for free, but true, I could do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for your for your project, your self portrait project. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Perpignan happened uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it is a huge photojournalism festival in Perpignan, France. It's called Visa pour le Manche. Uh, that's been going on for a long time. Yungi Kim, who is a very famous photojournalist who works with Contact Press Images and others, um, had a little exhibition of her work in Africa from 20 years ago, including the genocide in Rwanda. And uh, just so interesting to see, first of all, these old photos again. Mm -hmm. But also, it's just a reminder of good photography. You know, she's a really good photographer. Yeah, that first that first shot of the yeah. them running after the food truck and his, uh, his hand. Just and the shadow, out. yeah. You know? And you and you think, you think, well, that's just a happy accident. And the, and the, and part of it is, the, you know, there's a there's a quantity of luck that's involved with any success in life. I don't care whether it's taking a photo or re winning the lottery or you know whatever. But it's also, you know, if she had the camera an inch higher, she would have cut off the mm. foot. the foot lower a half a second slower. And, yeah. And she would have cut off the hand shadow. Too. Yeah, there's just yeah. so much that comes together that sort of instinctually you've, you've shot, you know, a million frames and then things start to click without you having to think about it. Just really great photography. Her, I mean, and, and her story from shooting these is just incredible. She went over there to photograph the famine that was going on and then all of a sudden she was in a war zone and she had no training at all. She was just thrown into it. Um, 
but she wanted to stay and she wanted to keep documenting and, and do what she had come for. And um, also, a really interesting point she made was that you know she didn't really feel the grief and the pain as much until she was back home going through and editing the work and figuring out which images to send in um, or just revisiting the negatives, which, you know, I wonder if it's different today with digital, like, when, when are you feeling that grief? Is it when you're looking through, you know, the contact sheet on your screen? Or it just must be a different experience looking through the negatives and making contact sheets of this stuff. I'm thinking it's kind of like a doctor in the ER room or a doctor in an oncology center. You don't want to feel that grief while you're treating the patient because right. it prevents you from doing your job. Right. So for her to just be kind of zoned in. Now, the other point of it is, you think 20 years ago, this is a Korean-American woman in the middle of Africa in a war zone. And, and not to be stereotypical at all, but, but she's probably the only Asian person within, you know, as far as the eye can see, and she's a woman, and she's in a war zone. All these things have to kind of weigh on you. Um, you know, what, I, I'm just curious to, to see what the perception of those around her were, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, in the non-internet age. You know, it's weak because, because even in some parts of the U.S. when I walk around, people are kind of looking at you funny because I'm Asian, which sounds crazy, but it, it happens. Um, so I, I just, it, it, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Yoongi. She's so pro-photographer rights, et cetera. That's the other thing. Um, she's always standing up for photographers. Uh, and it, it's just wonderful to see this work and wonderful that she had an exhibition for her. Um, speaking of kind of gritty photography, Bruce Gilden, whose photography I, I enjoyed, I, I found this on Reframe, which is part of Gizmodo. It's their, their photo blog on the Gizmodo, which is a tech blog. And it's a video of Bruce Gilden working the street in New York. And I couldn't believe what a jerk he is. <laughs> it's kind of staggering. Oh. He's just up in people's grill with oh, a flash. Yeah. Doesn't oh, yeah. care. Doesn't care. No, he. I saw him speak at Look 3 a couple years ago. And, yeah. I mean, he's a very, very outspoken guy and is going to do anything he needs to to get that shot. I mean, he gets the shot. It's just, you know, uh, he kind of gives photographers a bad name. Like, if somebody came up to me in the street and put a flash right, like, literally one foot from my face and put it off, like, I might, I might push the guy. Mm. I'm surprised that people are, are relatively well-behaved in these <laughs> situations, you know? But, of course, like, the, the photos that he get, gets are, are uh, they're great. So, I, I, I don't know, he's an artist, whatever. <laughs> he does what he needs to do. It's just very interesting. The video, the video is definitely worth watching. It's, uh, I think it was like a Swedish program, uh, so it has Swedish subtitles in there, um, but really interesting. Speaking of old school photographers, Jay Maisel. Jay is an incredible photographer, one of the titans of the industry. You would recognize his photography if you've ever seen the Miles Davis album, Kinda Blue. Um, it's, it's probably one of his most famous photos. He has owned this building on 190 Bowery uh, in New York that he purchased for $162,000, no, $102, a whole building Wow. $102,000 in 1966. So 1966, that's still a lot of money. The thing was valued up to $50 million. It's 38,000 square feet. And people walk by this thing all the time. They never know who it is, except a handful of photographers know who, knew, know who owns the building. Yes, yeah, so I've had this pointed out to me by a photographer. Yeah, Absolutely. it's a landmark yeah. building on the Lower East Side. Um, and it was sold. The price of the sale has not been disclosed, but I guarantee you it was tens of millions of dollars. <laughs> the buyer intends either to make luxury condos or a hotel or something. And Jay, I guess we'll get a nice pad someplace. Uh, they said, yeah, I'm, I, not, had, worried. I'm yeah, not worried. I'm not worried. <laughs> I've had friends who've been in there and they just say, oh my God, there's just so much stuff in there, but it's like, it's incredible. But, you know, they, they, this article talks about how there's no heat, how he lives in a very small part of it, because what oh. do they do with 38,000 square feet? 
You know, he I should have been it. renting it out to other artists. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> Well, now he can go buy some warehouse and, and do that if he really wanted to. But he's getting up in age, so it's good for him. You know, enjoy the fruits of your investment here. Yes. Um, an incredible, incredible building. But it's good that it's landmark protected because now they can't knock it down without a whole lot of to do. Good to know. Good to know. Cool. Good for you, Jay. Yeah. We've talked about Hasselblad and we've talked about Leica. And these are companies that have such a long legacy in... Uh, camera manufacturing. And they continue to make some good uh, cameras, some wonderful cameras, but they also make some of these dumb, 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 dumb moves. Dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb moves. <laughs> yep. Well, here's another head scratcher, and I haven't talked to a single photographer who thought this was a good idea. It's the Leica M. It's one of their digital cameras. The Leica M Edition 60. It it sells for a cool $19,500, and there's no screen on it. I thought that was a typo, the 19,000. I was like, that's a typo. It's got to be. And then I double-checked. Nope, not a typo. <laughs> yeah, the Leica M, by the way, is like a like a $7,000 camera or an $8,000 camera. Like, the, the normal version with a screen is like half the price of this. This doesn't have a screen. Wow. It has an ISO <laughs> dial on it. Now, I, you know, if you're going to do that, just shoot film. There's I no, know. There's I no know. benefit. You now, when the when the Nikon DF came onto the market, yes. which was sort of like, you know, emulating the old, you know, film style yeah. body of a camera. And you had written on our blog, on the Photo Shelter blog, you know, the camera of the future is not the camera of the past. That's what right. are we What are we doing? <laughs> That's right. Now, I don't know what this is. You know, the, the DF was, was cool because it had a lot of the analog dials. So you didn't have to go into some weird digital menu. Right. So, and, 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 and right. that, I think having manual dials is actually very handy for a photographer. That totally made sense to me. This, why would you spend twice as much money just to cover the screen? Just cover the screen. If that's your <laughs> gimmick, if you're like, oh, I'll just go out in the light and I've trained my eye to be able to see the difference between f5.6 and f6.3, well, good for you. Yeah. But yeah. There's, there's practical reasons to be able to review images at this point and I was trying to think of a good analogy of like why why would you do it? it's like it's like uh, it's like saying I'm not going to use email anymore I'm going to go back to faxing <laughs> you know so I bought a computer that doesn't have email on it it has a fax machine <laughs> built into it yes it's exactly like that oh my god do you think this will sell at all I mean you know, well you know there there are obviously Leica buffs out there and there are a lot of rich people who love Leica getting Leica because it's you know one of the most expensive uh, surely for a 35 millimeter, this is probably the most expensive yeah. uh, camera you can get. Mm -hmm. It's just dumb. Oh, it's silly. It's totally silly. Yeah, just oh. cover your screen on your uh, if you want. You know, if you want this. I, you know, these. <laughs> now, I, I, I feel for these camera manufacturers because it's really hard when you come from a mechanical history. Uh, like Hasselblad and Leica did, who were, they were known for their mechanics and their build quality, and a lot of that stuff kind of goes out the window when you're dealing with sensors. And so I, I imagine it's very difficult to like overhaul your R and D and say, okay, we're going to spend a billion dollars and like you, you know re redo the company, but this is not the way to save your company. Nope. Whatever. Okay, maybe they sell. I mean, it's a limited edition. They'll sell 250 of them and make some money and somebody will get a bonus and whatever. It's just dumb. Okay. <laughs> Someone will get a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> we end today. We started by talking about, oh, before we started the show, we were talking about you taking uh, a class at SVA and having a self-portrait project being your first thing. Yep, yep. Uh, and here we go with a selfie a day. Now, I saw this on Petapixel. And I saw, oh, selfie a day for eight years. And immediately, of course, you think of Noah Kalina, who's been doing it for over 10 years. Yeah. And you say, ah, what's the big deal? The big deal is he actually made like a hyperlapse film while he was doing this. So he's actually moving through the scene over the course of eight years while he's making the movie. So it's him. And, and we'll start it up so you can see it. But it's him like going through his house, lying down on his bed, 
Once right, getting ready, just getting ready for his day, watching TV. This. You see the sign moving behind him, walking through the hall. Like it took me, it took me a few seconds to realize what was happening before I was like, "Holy crap, this is incredible!" Yeah. <laughs> now, the amazing thing is, over the course of eight years, he actually doesn't change that much. <laughs> no, like, that's true too. He kind of looks the same. He kind of looks the same. He loses a little bit of weight. He like he loses some of the like the chunky baby fat that he had, but yeah. there's not a whole lot of aging otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> and the haircut doesn't. The haircut stays the same. The haircut's the same. <laughs> but this is really, really pretty incredible stuff. I know. Always, I'm always impressed by the self-discipline of doing this every day. Can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, and so apparently he started something similar with his child. Oh, wow. He's got a little baby, and he's been taking a photo a day. Now, it's not the same thing because, you know, you can't get a baby to stay still and go to the same place every day. And it's not a selfie. Yeah, right? but it's, it's four or five years of the baby turning into a little boy. Oh. Uh, and it's pretty incredible to watch, so you should check that guy out. Uh, what, what was his name here? Let's get it. Uh, he goes by Dumo on YouTube. Again, you can get this link and all the links by going to our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. That was a pretty good set of photos we looked at today, Sarah J. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. <laughs> hey, well, you're off to Brooklyn uh, to go see Photoville and see some of the Luminance Talks. Yeah. Uh, so have a good trip out there and enjoy it. I will be out there tomorrow for most of the day. Hey, all right. See you all then, right. Alan. So for Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off with another episode of I Love Photography Live. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.